In today's episode, we go over some of the most gruesome shark attacks told on the channel so far. From a man being bitten in half by a great white shark in front of his friends, to a man devoured in shallow water while peeing. These are some of the worst shark attacks you will ever hear. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Final Affliction. Jurian Bay is a coastal town about 275 kilometers from Perth, located in Western Australia. It is considered to be a family favorite, with great swimming opportunities and beautiful crystal clear beaches. It's a popular fishing spot, with many species readily available, such as herring and various shark species. Aside from those who enjoy the sport, there's plenty of fresh fish available for those who enjoy eating it without having to catch it first. Amazing restaurants offering hundreds of different styles of cooking. The area is also well known for its Australian sea lions, which are classified as endangered as the population continues to decrease over time. Since Jurian Bay is home to around 21% of the total population of this animal, many people come to visit for a chance to catch a glimpse of them before it's too late. With such a dense population of sea lions in one area, predators are always nearby. The locals know to be careful when entering these waters if they want to make it out alive. On August 19, 1967, Robert Bartle and his friend Lee Warner were preparing their dive at Jurian Bay. They were both in their 20s and were very experienced divers and spearfishers who enjoyed being in the ocean as much as possible. Early in the morning that day, the sea was particularly cool with a slight swell that seemed even more inviting. The problem with this swell is that it dragged up a lot of sand and silt from the ocean floor, significantly reducing the visibility underwater. There were already other divers in the water by the time they arrived, and many people were practicing for a spearfishing competition that would take place in the next month. They quickly got ready, changing into black neoprene suits and grabbing their single rubber spear guns, ready to see what they could find under the waves. Unfortunately for them, they would find much more than they bargained for, and only one of them would leave the water that day. Using floats, they were towed out into the deeper waters until they were about 700 meters away from the shore. They could see that the sea floor was barren beneath them until they spotted some limestone ledges which encouraged them to begin their dive. They knew that this environment was favored by large jewfish and were likely to make a decent catch if they went a little deeper. Lee initially remained on the surface to make sure everything was safe while Robert dived down to investigate the area and see if any fish were hiding within the caves. Unfortunately, he couldn't find any signs of the fish, so decided that it would be best to move to another area instead. He began his ascent back to the surface with Lee, but as he was looking upwards, he spotted a large dark figure barreling towards him from the murky water. He stayed still, staring at the figure as it dove down closer and closer towards him from the surface. He was frozen in fear as he slowly realized the size of the creature swimming towards him. He was quickly face to face with a large great white shark, the most aggressive species of shark in the world. It was around 14 feet long and was using its powerful tail to effortlessly close the gap between itself and Robert. Robert had no time to react. As soon as he realized what was approaching him, it was already too late. The shark grabbed Robert between the hip and the shoulder, sinking its teeth deep into his body. The water immediately started turning red as his blood began to dye the ocean around him. He tried to struggle while punching the shark, but he was no match against an 1,800-pound animal. He felt the animal readjust its grip on his body tighter as it began to shake him with immense force, breaking his neck with whiplash in the process. As it shook him, his body began to break apart like a straw toy in the mouth of a dog. The only mercy that Robert was afforded was that he died relatively quickly. Unlike bears who will start eating their prey before they have died, great white sharks will focus on killing their prey first to avoid any further resistance. With one final shake, Robert's body was ripped into two and the shark continued to circle the boat with his upper body still in its mouth, ready to be devoured later. 
Lee had been watching this attack in horror, seeing his friend brutally attacked and killed in front of him. It was immediately obvious that Robert was dead and there was nothing to be done, but now the shark had spotted him and had begun to circle him about three meters below. Seeing his friend Robert's upper body still in the shark's mouth, he knew that it wouldn't hesitate to kill him and that he now needed to fight for his own life. He looked around for something that he could use to save himself and spotted Robert's spear gun floating near him on the surface. He quickly grabbed it and fired it at the animal, hoping to strike it in the eye to scare it away from him. Despite being an experienced fisherman, the anxiety and terror of the situation proved to be too much and he missed the shot, sending the spear rocketing past the shark's head. The animal was undeterred and continued circling him as it prepared to strike once again. By some miracle, the shark had unexpectedly gotten entangled in the ropes of the floats and the spear gun, triggering the shark to start thrashing in the water trying to free itself. This gave Lee enough time to begin his escape. He hurriedly started swimming back to shore, swimming backwards and keeping the shark in his sights as much as he could to prevent another sneak attack. After an agonizing length of time, Lee reached the surface and pulled himself to shore, finally free from the tirade of the infamous Great White Shark. Now that he was on shore, he needed to tell someone what had happened. Robert's family had to be told. He ran to Robert's car but was unable to find the keys. Frustrated, he found keys belonging to another diver who was still in the water and took them, deciding that the diver would understand the circumstances in which his car was taken. He drove to a nearby fishing village 10 kilometers away and quickly found someone who owned a boat and begged them for help. He told Harry Holmes the whole story and everything he had seen. He was horrified by the events. He was the skipper of the Gay Jan and immediately agreed to take Lee back out on the water to try to recover Robert's body, hoping that the shark was still entangled in the ropes as before. As the two men were racing out to the shark, they saw other divers in the water and periodically stopped to get them out of the water, explaining what had happened and how the water was not currently safe. The divers very gratefully got into their boat, thanking them for helping them avoid the same fate that had befallen Robert. By the time they reached the dive point, they had a lot of people in the boat keeping an eye out for the shark. Suddenly, someone spotted it, still trapped in the same ropes that Lee had left it. The scene looked like it could have come from a horror movie, blood and body parts littering the ocean surrounding the shark. They could see that Robert's torso was still in the shark's mouth, but the rest of his body was gone. It had either sank to the seafloor or the shark had already begun to eat his body. The group tried to pull the shark towards the boat to retrieve Robert's body parts, but as they were just within reach, the ropes encasing the shark snapped. The divers quickly pulled back not knowing how the shark would now react. But luckily for them, it swam away from the scene, taking what was left of Robert with it. It's believed that the shark thought that the men were sea lions, as their black hooded suits would have given them the same appearance as the shark's natural prey. When Robert began to struggle while being bitten, he would have mimicked the natural reaction of a captured seal, which only would have triggered the predator response of the shark. It's unlikely that the shark was aware that it was preying on a human instead of a seal, but as the apex predator of the ocean, everything is considered to be a prey animal to the great white shark. People have been advised to wear different colored suits or stay out of the bay when there are high numbers of sharks, but the area continues to attract thousands of visitors every year despite this. A few months after the attack, a monument was erected by Robert's family to commemorate his life and pay tribute to others who died in such a horrific manner. Around the same time, a radio station posted a $500 reward for the experienced fisherman who could take down the shark responsible for Robert's death. One man, Peter Godby, spent 24 hours throwing whale meat into the water in the hopes of glimpsing the shark, but without success. The reward was widely advertised across Western Australia, although no one was able to ever claim the prize and the shark was never found. With an average lifespan of great white shark at 40 to 70 years, it's possible that this shark is still lurking the waters off the coast of Australia to this day, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike again, sending someone else to meet their terrifying final affliction.
Sailing the oceans on a luxury yacht sounds like the perfect way to spend a day or two. But what do you do when the yacht gets caught in a severe storm miles from the nearest land? Hopefully, the situation doesn't turn out like it did for Captain John Lipov and his crewmates. It was a clear sunny day in October 1982, and Deborah Kiley was excited to complete a job that she had been given. She had been tasked with transporting a luxury 18-meter yacht from Maine to its new billionaire owner in Florida. Deborah was a confident sailor and had even competed in the 70,000-kilometer Whitbread Round the World race, now called the Ocean Race. She even became the first American woman to complete the event in 1981. The 24-year-old woman was joined on her journey aboard the yacht by a group of her friends. There was the captain of the ship, John Lipoth, his girlfriend, Meg Mooney, and friends Brad Kavanaugh and Mark Adams. The day was perfect for sailing, with clear, bright blue skies. Deborah couldn't have asked for better conditions to set out on the luxury ship. The journey was to take six days long and be over 2,000 kilometers, so the group of friends would have plenty of time to enjoy the yacht and simply relax as they sailed to their destination. But things didn't exactly go to plan. Two days into the journey, the skies above the group of five began to darken, and in the distance, a brewing storm crept ever closer. By nightfall on the second day, the yacht was caught in the middle of a severe and violent tropical storm. The storm was so bad that winds up to 110 kilometers per hour and waves 10 meters high battered the yacht. Deborah had been sleeping in the cabin when the panicked voices of her friends awoke her. Rushing to the deck, the young woman was horrified to see that their captain, John Lipoth, was lying drunk at the wheel of the ship. Immediately, all five of the friends began screaming in fear. With the amount of water that was rushing over the yacht, the group knew that the worst possible thing was happening. They were sinking. With no other option, the group of five jumped off of the sinking yacht and into the rolling waves below. However, just before Meg was able to escape, she lost her footing and fell into a sharp part of the ship, cutting her legs severely. But with no time to do anything about it, the woman jumped into the water with her friends. Thankfully, Mark had been able to grab an inflatable dinghy, which the terrified group of young men and women clung to as they watched the 18-foot yacht sink beneath the ocean, never to be seen again. Acting quickly, all five crew members clambered onto the dinghy, but as Mark pulled himself into the boat, he felt something hard nudge his leg. Once in the safety of the dinghy, the group peered into the dark water below them, where Deborah was just about able to make out the shape of something that looked like a torpedo. Thinking that it was a fish at first, the young woman was horrified to realize what the creature actually was as it swam closer. Swimming just below the surface of the waves were hundreds of sharks. The animals had been drawn to the group as they had smelt the blood seeping from Meg's wound. Hungry and ready for a hunt, the sharks rammed against the dinghy from all directions. All Deborah and her friends could do was hold on to the small life raft and pray that they would make it through the night. As the hours waned on, the storm gradually faded and daylight broke through the darkness of the night. At first, the group of five friends were relieved. They believed that they would be able to get to safety in the daylight, as surely someone would be able to spot them in the dinghy. But as the hours passed by and all that Deborah and her friends could see was the never-ending expanse of blue sky and ocean, their hope quickly began to disappear. By the third day of drifting aimlessly in the ocean, the group of five friends had no hope at all. Meg's wound had become seriously infected, leaving the young woman dealing with a severe case of blood poisoning. If she wasn't able to get help, and quickly, it was likely that she wouldn't last much longer. As well as that, everyone on the dinghy was starving and unbearably thirsty, and with so much water all around them, it wasn't long before John and Mark decided to brave the salty taste of the ocean and to gulp down as much as they could. The problem with this, though, is that the salt content in seawater is much higher than what can be processed by a human body. 
and because water is needed to process the salt in the body, it actually leaves the person more dehydrated than before they had a drink. After a few hours, both Mark and John had begun suffering from the side effects of the salt water. The severe dehydration that they were enduring led them to begin to hallucinate. John Lipoff was the first to succumb to his hallucinations. He claimed that he could see land far off in the distance. Unable to persuade him otherwise, the rest of the crew could only watch as their captain dove into the water and began swimming towards the land that only he could see. As the group of four watched John swim away, they all jumped as a scream tore through the air. The blood-curdling scream only lasted for one moment before silence descended once again. Deborah and the rest of the crew knew what had happened. The sharks, which had been lurking underneath them for days on end, had finally gotten their first meal. Horrified, Deborah, Meg, and Brad sat frozen in the dinghy, unsure of what to do next. But Mark was none the wiser. Lost in his own hallucinations, Mark stood up and told the rest of his friends that he needed to run to the store to buy some beer and cigarettes. Then, ignoring the panicked pleading of his friends, he stepped off of the dinghy and into the water. However, this time when the sharks attacked, Deborah and the other two crewmates were able to see a lot more. Because of how close Mark was to the life raft, the rest of the crew were able to feel as the great whites rammed into the boat underneath as they tore apart and bit into Mark. Every bump and rock of the little dinghy had Deborah crying. She could only imagine what was happening beneath her, how the sharks were sinking their two and a half inch razor sharp teeth into Mark's body and ripping him apart. The young woman never imagined that something so horrific would happen to her and she was terrified that she would end up in the same situation as Mark and John. The hours passed by with Deborah, Brad, and Meg lying in the dinghy, full of a faded mixture of urine, pus, and blood from Meg's wound. It was clear that things weren't looking good for the young woman. Her wound had become so infected that her leg had actually started to turn black. Eventually, as the fourth day rolled around, Deborah Kiley and Brad Kavanaugh awoke to find that Meg had passed away from her injury sometime during the night. Now, when people are stuck in extremely difficult situations, it can lead them to think about doing things that would never usually cross their minds. And with how hungry and thirsty he was, Brad couldn't help but contemplate eating Meg's body. It had been four days since he had had anything to eat and drink, and the young man knew that he couldn't continue to go on without eating her, or he would surely die too. However, Deborah was able to get him to come to his senses. She told Brad that eating Meg was out of the question. Not only was she their friend, but her infection was so bad that it was likely that it would do more harm than good to cannibalize her. But the two remaining friends also knew that Meg's body couldn't remain in the dinghy with them. Her wound was oozing pus from the infection, and if even a small amount of it got into Brad or Deborah's blood, then they would also become severely ill. With no other option, the two remaining survivors stripped Meg's body of her clothes and jewelry. They wanted to give the young woman's family something to remember her by. Then, after reciting the Lord's Prayer, Deborah and Brad gently pushed the body of their friend overboard. Not wanting to listen to the sharks devouring another one of their friends, Deborah and Brad went straight to sleep. By the fifth day at sea, Deborah and Brad had given up all hope of being rescued. Seeing all of the blood and other bodily fluids in the boat, the pair of survivors decided to try and clean up the dinghy. As Brad was trying to empty the raft, though, a rogue wave suddenly had him tumbling over the side of the boat and into the shark-infested waters below. Panicking, as neither he nor Deborah wanted the sharks to attack again, Brad tried his hardest to clamber back into the dinghy, but with how exhausted and weak he was, Brad was unable to lift himself up. Resigned to his fate, the young man clung onto the side of the raft, waiting for the moment when he would feel the painful bite of one of the sharks. Right at that moment, though, off in the distance, both Deborah and Brad spotted what looked to be a cargo ship. After confirming with each other that it was real and not a hallucination, Brad became reinvigorated. Seeing how close he was to being rescued, the young man managed to haul himself back onto the life raft. Once safely back in the dinghy, 
Deborah and Brad began yelling as loud as they could for help. After the cargo ship was close enough and had spotted the pair of survivors, they lifted both Deborah and Brad out of the water and onto the safety of the ship. Safely on board, the two survivors learned that they were 140 kilometers south of Cape Lookout. This meant that they drifted almost 150 kilometers off of their original course. But the ordeal wasn't over for the two of them. Those fateful five days at sea changed Deborah and Brad's life forever. For years after the incident, Deborah couldn't close her eyes without hearing the screams of her friends as they were eaten by sharks. She went on to write about her ordeal in two separate books, whilst also becoming a motivational speaker about surviving against all odds. Sadly, in 2012, at the age of 54, by causes unknown to the public, Deborah also met her final affliction. Shark attacks are the stuff of nightmares. They're what horror movies are made of, and yet, Considering the number of people who enter the water each year, they are still quite rare. But there are a few conditions which make shark attacks more likely to happen. In this shark attack, a few of these conditions may have played a role. Attacks are more common in water that is warmer than 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius. This is probably because these temperatures are more appealing for swimmers and so more people enter the water when it's warmer. Attacks also tend to occur during dusk and dawn, when sharks are most active, or just after noon, which is when most people go for a swim. They are also more likely to occur at the surface of the water or in choppy seas. Our swimming movements are more erratic at the surface or in turbulent water, and we may be considered distressed prey, a magnet for sharks. We may even be misidentified as another prey animal, such as a sea lion, when we are silhouetted against the surface of the water. Some of these reasons for attacks seem to have been the cause for a fatality that happened in Australia back in 1959. Two young men, Stanley Mullins and Raphael Bishop, headed out to sea in the early morning of December 19th. The water temperature in the Coral Sea around Brisbane at that time of year is typically high 70s to low 80s, or 24 to 27 degrees Celsius. The sun was already making its way high into the sky. The sea was rough. Wavelets broke on the surface of the water, churning up the sand beneath. Visibility in the water was low. Stanley and Raphael made their way to Wynnum in Moreton Bay, situated just south of Brisbane. The bay is home to numerous islands, including North Stradbroke Island, Moreton Island, and the Southern Moreton Bay Islands. These islands offer a range of activities, such as swimming, surfing, snorkeling, and hiking. They are a popular destination with tourists and locals alike. The region is home to a variety of wildlife, including dolphins, turtles, and seabirds. Also prowling the waters are sharks. Since records of shark attacks began in 1962, there have been 39 attacks off the coast of Brisbane, six of which proved fatal. Stanley and Raphael unloaded their vehicle and dragged their dinghy across the sand and into the water. Holding it steady against the breaking waves, they climbed in. Each with an oar in hand, they paddled against the rushing water. They made it out beyond the breakers and continued to paddle until about a mile and a half from the shore. Then they stopped. They were spending the morning crabbing from the boat. It was a pastime that they both enjoyed, being out on the water, away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The boat was rocking in the choppy surf, but the two friends were used to it. They hauled in the crabs, filling up their buckets with ease. The day was going well. It was an enjoyable start to the day, and the two friends would be back home in time for breakfast. But the sound of their voices, the vibrations of the sea hitting the sides of the boat, and the smell of the fresh bait enticed something closer. A predator was lurking nearby under the waves. Through curiosity and always on the lookout for an opportunistic meal, a bull shark circled the murky waters below. It was watching and waiting. It was investigating the little boat bobbing up and down in the sea. It was curious. As Stanley lowered his line into the water once more, 
he accidentally knocked his oar overboard. They needed it to get back to shore. It would be tough with only one oar against the rough sea. In the choppy water, it was getting further and further away from the boat. Without hesitating, Stanley pulled off his shirt and dived into the water. He swam a few yards and grabbed hold of the oar. The salt water stung his eyes. The salt spray slapped his face. He turned around and headed back to the boat. The oar floated on the surface of the water, and he pushed it along in front of him, back towards the dinghy. Raphael continued to dangle his line over the side of the boat. His friend would be back on board in no time. Stanley was only feet from the boat when he felt a sharp tug on his legs. He cried out a heart-wrenching scream. Raphael quickly jumped to the other side of the boat. He leaned over the side to help his friend, but it was too late. Stanley had vanished. He had disappeared below the surface of the ocean in an instant. One second he was there, and the next he was gone. Raphael frantically looked around for his friend. He couldn't see any trace of him. There was no blood. There were no bubbles or ripples, no splashing or thrashing. He had only managed to let out a single cry before becoming completely submerged, never to be seen alive again. Shocked, devastated, and terrified after an extensive search for Stanley, Raphael made it back to shore. He called the authorities and recounted the story to them. It was a mystery. Although a shark was suspected, some officials suggested heart failure or cramp as there was no sighting of a shark. There hadn't been a struggle which was usually witnessed with shark attacks. Perhaps it had been such a large shark that it had practically swallowed him whole. Maybe it had dragged him underwater so quickly that it didn't leave a trace. Or maybe multiple sharks dragged him down. His family and friends needed answers. Soon, there would be some evidence, but it might produce more questions than answers. Three days after his disappearance, professional fisherman Desmond Burks was fishing just off the coast of Wynnum. He had heard of Stanley's disappearance, and now he was fishing in almost exactly the same spot. He spotted something in the water, a terrible and disturbing discovery. Upon closer inspection, it was the body of a young man, the body of Stanley. Desmond pulled him aboard and called the officials to report the finding. The 29-year-old was missing an arm. He had several bites across his body reminiscent of a shark attack. But when his body was examined by medical professionals, it was believed that he had been subjected to multiple attacks. Different bite marks on his body were made by different sharks. Had Stanley been killed by a group of sharks? A pack? The local newspapers seemed to think so as they described how father of five Stanley Mullins had been torn apart by a pack of bull sharks whilst swimming offshore. It was a tragic incident. He had been taken so young and left behind a young family. Five children were now without their father, but is it likely that he was killed by more than one shark? A feeding frenzy? Surely there would have been some evidence during the attack if there had been multiple sharks in the area. Surely Raphael would have seen some kind of commotion in the water. Had he really dived right into the middle of a pack of sharks to retrieve his oar without knowing it? Bull sharks are considered extremely dangerous for humans due to their aggressive tendencies and ability to swim in both fresh and salt water. They can travel up rivers and are found near estuaries and shallow coastal waters, the same waters that people often frequent. The females are the larger of the two sexes and can grow up to 8 feet long and weigh up to 130 kilograms or 290 pounds. But bull sharks are typically solitary hunters, only occasionally coming together in pairs to track prey. During certain times of the year when fish populations are concentrated, multiple sharks may gather in a small area to feed. This feeding frenzy can involve several individuals hunting together. Maybe this was the case with Stanley. It is not known exactly what happened to Stanley. It is most probable that he was taken by a shark, a large one that caught him completely unawares and took him below the surface without a struggle. It is possible his body was then scavenged by other sharks before being found by the fishermen. Despite tragic and terrifying events such as that of Stanley Mullins, the odds of being attacked by a shark are as tiny as 1 in 3 billion. Although these cases are extremely rare, 
If the attack happens to you, then it doesn't matter how rare it is, you will still be fighting for your life inside the jaws of one of nature's most powerful and formidable predators, praying that you survive and avoid meeting your terrifying final affliction. Marcella Rocha Santos and the beachgoers at Piedi de Beach were having the time of their lives. The dry July of 2021 was a blistering one in Brazil, even warmer than the usual mild weather that came with the off-season. The sands were speckled with locals hoping to cool off in the water, and without the inconvenience of the usual hordes of tourists to pack up the beach, the afternoon was turning out to be a very enjoyable one. Children were playing, girls were showing off their bikini bodies, and old friends were catching up. This is a high alert season for beachgoers since it's the bull shark's nesting time. Brazilians are no strangers to shark attacks on their shores. The beaches are littered with warning signs, and almost no one ventures past the first few waves. Children are kept in the rock pools, and the few brave souls who do dare to swim farther are quickly brought back by the lifeguards that are spaced out every few meters. And if the lifeguards were to miss a naughty teenager trying to show off, the more responsible sunbathers and spectators are quick to jump in to keep a situation from becoming a deadly one. Marcelo was there with a dozen of his friends. They'd bought coolers packed to the brim with cold beer and ciders, and the street vendors supplied more than enough delicious food to keep the party going on for the whole day. They'd started off their day on the sand at around 9 that morning, and by the time noon had come and gone, everyone was in high spirits, and the trash bag beside the cool box had more empty bottles in it than the cooler had cold ones left. The water emptied at noon, the sun was just too hot for most to bear, and swimming in the high sun was just asking for a sunburn. The young families with children went home, their overtired toddlers crying in protest, leaving the beach to the partygoers who were starting to get rowdy. The water cleared just in time, because a seven-foot bull shark had just begun to circle the water. The mating season went by some months ago, and she'd already given birth to her young. The aquatic beast was desperately hungry. When she smelled the warm bodies in the water, she was miles away, and it took her all morning to reach the beach that smelled so tantalizing. The swimming children were blissfully unaware of the animal that was inching closer to them. At one point, her fin sliced through the water's surface, but no one even noticed, and twice she locked in on a target that swam out far enough from the shallows, only to have the human retreat back to the shore before she could strike. She was getting impatient. When the water cleared in the midday glare, only a handful of individuals stepped into the water, and then it was only to their waists. They left behind a rank ammonia smell before retreating back to the sand. The animal did not know it, but people were walking into the water to relieve themselves. The beach had no bathroom, and when nature called, the partygoers would step into the water just deep enough to look like they were cooling off and release the contents of their bladders discreetly. But the shark did know that she wasn't going to get lucky with a brave individual that broke off from the pack to swim in deeper waters anymore. If she was going to eat at all today, she'd have to get closer right in the shallows, where she wouldn't have as much of an advantage as she'd have in the deep. So she crept in, her gray body stalking silently through the water, circling and waiting for another to come in. All the while, the party continued to pick up steam outside in the sun. Marcelo's group of 12 had grown to nearly 20 as acquaintances happened to come by, and old friends ran into each other. Marcelo and his friend Ademir were off to the side, having a heated but friendly argument about football. Both men were in their 50s, and they naturally sought out each other's company, away from the younger crowd, who were talking about trendy topics that didn't interest them all that much. After many beers and laughter, Marcelo was starting to get uncomfortable. Without even suggesting it, both men got up from the ground and walked over to the waves. Ademir had just as much to drink as Marcelo and he needed to pee just as badly, so together they waded into the water without breaking their conversation. Up high from his post, the lifeguard on duty noticed the men walking into the shallows, 
but he knew exactly what they were doing, so he didn't think it was necessary to warn them to stay out of the deep. And sure enough, Adamir and Marcella only went in until they were waist deep. The lifeguard relaxed and resumed scanning the rest of the beach for more pressing cases than two men relieving themselves. No one could have known what danger Adamir and Marcello were in. If it were any other season, people might have noticed the approaching shadow just beneath the surface. But the murky water hid the predator completely, and she became instantly aware of the two men who stepped into her domain. Their warmth and their movements reached her senses long before the ammonia that they were leaving behind did. Still in the middle of their discussion on the tactical mistakes and the biased referee of the football game a few days ago, Marcelo and Adamir stood talking and peeing out in the surf. Adamir's hands were talking with his mouth, gesturing wildly in the air, and Marcelo was laughing heartily with him when the beast was struck, pummeling at them like a bullet. She closed her jaws on the nearest piece of flesh she could reach, Marcello's thigh. Her trajectory blasted Adamir aside, sending him crashing into the water. Marcello was thrown backward, his head going under as the beast rammed into him. The animal had misjudged the size and weight of the fully grown man, and even though she'd taken a sizable chunk out of his leg, she didn't get a firm enough grip on him to drag him deeper in. The men spluttered and gagged on salt water, struggling to regain their footing. Adamir got up to race to the beach, but Marcelo's leg gave out under him. He hadn't even realized that he'd been bitten until he went down a second time. That's when the bright red water and the shooting pain in his thigh finally registered to him. Adamir grabbed his friend's outstretched hand to pull him out, but Marcelo was suddenly ripped from his grasp. The animal was back. She'd taken a hairpin loop and attacked again, this time grabbing hold of the injured man's right hand and ripping it clean off with her razor-sharp teeth. Adamir dove in after Marcelo, this time getting his left arm in his grasp. Adamir didn't take time to look for the beast, nor did he even bother to lift Marcelo's head out of the water. He just started wading to shore, dragging his friend along as fast as he could. The water around them was now a deep crimson red. Marcello wasn't just bleeding from his right stump. The shark had severed the femoral artery in his leg, too. He was pumping out his life's blood from two major arteries, and in the seconds between the attack and Adamir dragging him out onto the sand, Marcello had already lost consciousness. The entire event happened so suddenly that the partygoers hadn't even realized that anything was wrong until Adamir dragged the bleeding man onto the sand. Dropping everything in hand, they rushed forward to get Marcelo further out of the water, but he was dead before the ambulance even hit the road to get to him. Bleeding from both major veins took less than three minutes to kill him. It wasn't until the next tourist season that anyone stepped into the water around Piedad Beach again, and then it was only tourists that went in. The locals stayed clear for almost a year. An attack in waters so shallow was just too close to home for mothers to allow their babies to go anywhere near the beach. And for the rest, well, a few beers in the sun could be had around the barbecue, just as enjoyably as it would have been on the shore. Besides, the memories of one of their own lost to those waters was just too fresh to even think of going back. They all feared that they, too, would meet their terrifying final affliction. Sharks are one of the most misunderstood animals on Earth. Not only are they awe-inspiring predators, but they play a vital role in the health of our oceans. But when it comes to a shark species that gives its brethren a lousy name, none can argue that the ferocious bull shark takes the cake regarding savagery and unpredictability. Bull sharks are considered mainly to be the most aggressive type of sharks toward humans. Many experts say this is due to their short temper and ability to travel up rivers. Other experts attribute their hazardous nature to the simple fact that they typically hunt near areas where people often swim, such as along tropical coastlines. They reside worldwide in shallow, warm waters and have been recorded to go into freshwater rivers quite frequently. 
Although bull sharks may appear to be dwarfed by their cousins, the great whites, who are considered to be significantly larger, stronger, and faster than bull sharks, the latter's invasive behavior of living close to human populations near beaches makes them far more dangerous. Furthermore, bulls are generally much more aggressive by nature, thus increasing the odds of an encounter with a bull shark quickly turning deadly. Bull sharks are known to be voracious eaters and will consume almost any type of food. While their diet mainly revolves around fish, they are everything but shy about preying on bigger games such as dolphins and sea turtles. They'll even attack other sharks. These predators are always active too, hunting both day and night. Sharks in general are not mindless killing machines, contrary to popular belief and pop culture norms. In fact, they are relatively shy, reclusive creatures that spend most of their time cruising the ocean's waters in search of food. While it's true that some species of sharks, like the aforementioned bull shark, are more aggressive than others, most attacks on humans directly result from humans trespassing or agitating the shark in some way. But how did these reclusive and awe-inspiring creatures get such a fierce reputation? Some say it all started with the horrifying series of tragedies known as the Jersey Shore Shark Attacks, an incident so bizarre and deadly that the reputation of these once admired creatures has become forever tarnished. The Jersey Shore Shark Attacks of 1916 occurred between July 1st and 12th along the shore of New Jersey. At the time, the United States was reeling from the effects of a severe summer heat wave and polio epidemic, which brought thousands of people to the beach resorts of the Jersey Shore, all seeking shelter from the scorching heat. With so many bystanders gathering so close to an area with many reported shark sightings, it was only a matter of time before horror ensued. The first large-scale attack was on Saturday, July 1st at Beach Haven, this is a resort that is located on Long Beach Island, which is off the southern coast of New Jersey. Charles Epting Van Sant, who was 28 and originally from Philadelphia, was vacationing with his family at the Engleside Hotel when the attack occurred. Van Sant went for a swim in the Atlantic with his dog before dinner. However, shortly after entering the water, Van Sant began shouting. At first, swimmers believed he was calling to the dog on the beach soon realized that a shark was actually biting his legs. He was pulled out by a lifeguard and a bystander who volunteered to help him. The two later claimed that the vicious shark followed them as they pulled Van Sant from shore. Van Sant's left thigh was so mutilated, bystanders could visibly see parts of the bone sticking out. The shark had literally stripped his flesh clean off his bones. Nonetheless, he would go on to survive this horrifying ordeal, succumbing to his injuries and bleeding to death at around 6.45 p.m. After the first incident in Beach Haven, scientists and the press were reluctant to blame the death of Charles Van Sant on a shark. Instead, some blamed the whole incident on Charles himself, claiming that the shark was going for his dog and that if Charles hadn't intervened, the shark wouldn't have bitten him. Others, such as Pennsylvania State Fish Commissioner and retired Philadelphia Aquarium Administrator James M. Meehan, heavily downplayed the threat sharks pose to humans. Because of that, the Van Sant attack didn't stop people from going to the beach. In fact, even when sea captains reported seeing large sharks swimming near Newark and New York City, people still elected to ignore their warnings. Another tragedy of its kind occurred just 45 miles north of Beach Haven in Spring Lake, New Jersey, proving that these reports were not unfounded. James Meehan's previous statements would come back to haunt him following this attack, the victim of which was Charles Bruder, a 27-year-old Swiss bell captain who worked at a hotel. He was attacked by a shark while swimming a short distance away from shore. The savage beast bit him in his abdomen severing both legs just below the knees. The water ran red with Bruder's blood in what must have been a traumatizing spectacle. After hearing screams, a woman notified two lifeguards that a canoe had turned over and was floating next to a pool of crimson water. After two lifeguards reached Bruder in a rowboat, they quickly realized he had been attacked by a shark. As they were pulling him out of the water, he sadly died of blood loss before they could make it. 
It was reported that the beach echoed with the screams and wailings of horrified onlookers, with some fainting or panicking at the mere sight of his mangled body. This time, the story was gaining front-page coverage on prominent newspapers such as the Boston Herald, the Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Scientists were, yet again, called upon to answer the public's concerns and attempt to diffuse its panic, with a press conference being held where said scientists theorized that the odds of a third attack happening are extremely low. Shockingly, two other major assaults took place afterward, both at Matawan Creek, close to Keyport, where it's been long presumed that Matawan's unique location, 30 miles north of Spring Lake and inland from Raritan Bay, made it unlikely for interactions between sharks and humans to occur. As a result, when local sea captain Thomas Cottrell spotted an eight-foot-long shark in the creek, the town disregarded him. Lester Stillwell, age 11, was among a group of boys playing in the stream on Wednesday, July 12th. At around 2 p.m., the boys spotted what looked like an old black weather-beaten board or worn log, but as soon as they saw its dorsal fin jutting out of the water, they knew it was a shark. The beast seized the opportunity and lunged at them, quickly snatching poor Stillwell in between its powerful jaws and dragging him into the water before he could climb out of the creek. Many adults rushed to the scene to investigate after the kids went to town for help, including county businessman Watson Stanley Fisher. After discovering Stillwell's body, they were heading back to shore when suddenly, in front of everyone, Watson, who was carrying the boy at the time, fell prey to yet another shark attack. It took rescuers five hours to recover young Lester's body. As for Watson Fisher, by the time he was rescued, his right thigh was mutilated beyond recognition, and he consequently passed away at the Monmouth Memorial Hospital. The last recorded victim, Joseph Dunn, was only 14 years old and hailing from New York City. He was attacked just 30 minutes after the attacks on Lester and Watson took place, and a half mile away from where it all started at Wyckoff Dock. This time, the bite inflicted upon Dunn was luckily on his left leg. While still life-threatening, it gave his brother and friend, who were close by, enough time to rescue him and get him to St. Peter's Hospital after an intense struggle against the vicious animal. Thankfully, on September 15, 1916, he was released after making a full recovery. The Jersey Shore attacks led to mass hysteria throughout New York and New Jersey. Some even describe the panic as unrivaled in American history. Needless to say, after the attacks, measures had to be taken. It didn't help at all that resort owners were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars as a result of declining tourism. Following the five attacks and hundreds of newspaper articles written on the incident, the public was heavily incentivized not to go anywhere near the beach, not even for sunbathing. In the face of public outcry, shark hunts became common along the coasts of New Jersey and New York. Governor James Fairman Fielder of New Jersey proposed a plan that would award individuals for every shark they killed, leading to what is now known as the largest scale animal hunt in history. On July 14th, only two days after the final attack in Matawan Creek, fisherman Michael Schleiser caught a 7.5 foot, 2.3 meter, 325 pound, 147 kilogram shark while fishing nearby in Raritan Bay. The shark was close to sinking the boat before Schleiser killed it with a broken oar. When he cut open the shark's belly, he found what he called a suspicious fleshy material, along with some bones that weighed 15 pounds. Scientists later identified the shark as a young great white, and the ingested remains were found to be human. No further attacks were reported along the Jersey Shore in the summer of 1916 after this, prompting known experts to declare that Schleiser's great white shark was the one and only Jersey man-eater. However, in 2002, some experts speculated that the long-presumed perpetrator of such attacks, the great white shark, may not be guilty of as many assaults as commonly believed. In the end, after much speculation and years of research, it was discovered that the 1916 shark attacks in New Jersey, as well as many other similar incidents, might have actually been caused by the lesser-known bull shark due to its ability to migrate in freshwater environments unlike other shark species. 
Nonetheless, the infamous Jersey Shore attacks of 1916 were not only one of the most bizarre and brutal series of shark attacks in recorded history, but also ensured that the reputation of sharks everywhere would forever be besmirched. It's important to remember that sharks are not the indiscriminate killing machines that they're often made out to be. The majority of shark species are actually shy, retiring creatures that pose very little threat to humans. With that being said, it's still crucial to be cautious and respectful when entering the waters where sharks live. After all, we are invading their territory, not the other way around. Hopefully, with a better understanding of these creatures, we can learn to coexist peacefully and not have to suffer the horrible consequences of a direct encounter with these terrifying animals. An encounter that for many is followed up by their horrifying final affliction. Australia is probably most well known as the land that is always trying to kill you. And with the amount of dangerous animals that live there, it's not hard to see why. Even something as cute looking as a kangaroo could do you some serious harm if you get too close to it. And one of the country's deadliest animals that most people try to stay well away from are sharks. Surrounded by tropical and typically warm seas, Australia is the perfect place for all sorts of marine life to thrive. The warm waters ensure that there is plenty of food for all manners of animals, including sharks. Whilst great whites are the creatures that are often talked about off of the Australia coasts, that is not the species that features in this story. Instead, the type of shark which caught people's attention in early February 2023 was actually a bull shark. Whilst films like Jaws might have put people off of great white sharks, many experts believe that bull sharks are actually the most dangerous sharks in the world. This is because they're an aggressive species of shark, preying on almost anything they believe they can eat, such as fish, dolphins, and sea turtles. They will even hunt other species of shark if it is smaller than them. But what makes them truly dangerous is the fact that they tend to hunt in waters where people often swim, namely along tropical shorelines. One of the most amazing things about bull sharks, though, is the fact that they have developed special adaptations in the way that their kidneys function, along with special glands near their tails, which help them keep salt in their bodies. This means that Whilst other sharks need to stay in salt water in order to survive, bull sharks can actually swim into freshwater rivers where they often give birth to their young. They do this as there are fewer predators in the rivers, which gives the baby sharks a better chance of survival. However, it also means that rivers can be incredibly dangerous places for people, especially if they're swimming in them. Something that 16-year-old Stella Berry discovered the hard way in early 2023. Due to where Australia is located in the world, being close to the equator, it can get incredibly hot during their summer months. Because of this, most people typically head to the closest body of water possible to try and cool off from the intense heat of the day. Stella Berry and her friends were simply one of these groups of people looking for a bit of fun and for a nice cool place to relax and swim. The teenagers, who all lived in or around North Fremantle, decided that they would head to a local river called the Swan River. Located near Perth, Swan River ends up leading out into the ocean along Australia's west coast, nearby to South Beach. The group of teenagers thought that the river would be less busy than the beach and a bit more sheltered from waves and dangerous sea creatures. Being only 16, the group of friends were simply enjoying their time together and making memories that would hopefully last them the rest of their lives. Whilst the group were most certainly not the only people to have had the idea to spend the day at the river, it wasn't overcrowded, which meant that they were able to swim and relax relatively unbothered. After spending a bit of time swimming in the refreshing river, Stella and her friends then began sunbathing. The day was simply perfect. At around half three in the afternoon, whilst Stella was resting on the edge of the river, she suddenly spotted a flash of gray in the water. After a few more seconds, the young girl realized what she had just seen. A pod of dolphins were swimming up the river, most likely heading back out to the ocean. 
Wanting to get a better look at the amazing animals, Stella decided to jump into the river and swim a bit closer. This in itself is a very dangerous thing to do as, whilst dolphins might seem like kind and loving animals, they can actually harm people severely, especially when they are startled or made to feel like they are in danger. Only moments after getting into the river and starting to make her way over to the dolphins, Stella felt a sharp and excruciating painful tug on her leg. Something had grabbed her. The young girl, frantic and in pain, began thrashing about to try and get herself free from whatever it was that had grabbed a hold of her leg. Unfortunately, all of her panicking only seemed to enrage the animal more. It was at this point that she knew that the only thing that could attack her like that was a shark. Terrified and trying to fight for her life, Stella yelled and called out. However, she was simply no match for the hungry predator. The young girl's friends could do nothing but watch from the side of the river, calling out for help and trying to encourage Stella to fight back and get away from the shark. All of the commotion caught the attention of a man nearby who, after realizing what was going on, quickly jumped into the water to try and help Stella escape. After making his way over to the young girl, the man, who did not want to be named, managed to get her away from the shark who had seemingly disappeared for a moment. Seeing as this was his chance to save her, the man quickly dragged Stella back to the shore of the riverbank. The entire time that he did this, the young teenager was entirely unconscious. Whether this was from the shock of what had just happened to her, or the fact that her wound had caused her to pass out, it was difficult to tell. Whilst this was happening, emergency services, including police boats, rushed to the scene near the Fremantle traffic bridge. Luckily, someone had the forethought to contact them as they knew that Stella would be needing medical attention as quickly as possible. Once Stella and her rescuer were safely back on land, the teenager was quickly attended to by paramedics who heroically tried to save her life. Unfortunately, the injuries to her leg were simply too substantial and she sadly passed away. After the tragic incident, authorities put out a warning online to dissuade others from swimming in the river whilst they searched for the shark which had attacked the young girl. They did not want another incident to occur and for someone else to end up with the same tragic fate. Eventually, roughly a day later, a 2.5 meter bull shark was caught about one kilometer from where Stella was attacked. A local fisherman had said that bait was used to lure the animal into the area they were fishing in. However, what shocked them was the fact that the shark did not come from the ocean, but from further up the river. Once the animal was captured, it was relocated to the ocean, quite a distance away from the river, so that it would hopefully not return to the popular swimming place again. While some people might think that it would have been better off to euthanize the shark as it had attacked a human, Advocates for the species believed that it was better to relocate it, as it had simply been acting on its instincts and likely thought Stella was one of the dolphins that had been swimming by. However, because she was separate from the pod, she was an easier target for the shark, who took the opportunity to try and get what it likely thought was an easy meal. Despite the circumstances for why the attack happened, people in the area were shocked and saddened by the tragedy that occurred. It was the first fatality in the Swan River by a shark attack in over a century. All of Stella's friends and her school held a vigil for the young girl who had been a well-liked person and who was often regarded highly by those who knew her. Many of her friends said how she was always kind to everyone and how she didn't have a bad word to say about anyone. She was also a talented athlete and keen hockey player, and she had hoped to live in Europe once she was old enough to travel. But whilst she might no longer be with us, Stella's friends and family will forever hold her memory in their hearts. And whilst officials did say that the chance of a shark attack happening in the river is incredibly rare, the chances are never zero in places where they are known to live. Not even the rivers are safe in Australia from meeting your terrifying final affliction.